Hymn number 12, this is one of the oldest hymns that we have in our hymnals. Uh, some think it's fr- uh, from around the 3rd or 4th century, and then obviously translated for us in England uh, in, into English, but gives us a wonderful picture into the worship of heaven, and we can join in our voices. Uh, why don't I, I'll sing the first stanza so you can get the melody if you don't know the melody, and then we'll all stand together and we'll sing uh, all three stanzas. Can we just sing the first stanza? Holy God, we praise thy name, Lord of all, we bow before thee, all on earth thy scepter claim, all in heaven above adore thee. Let's all stand together and we'll sing on that first stanza. Holy God, we praise thy name. If the uh, children's ensemble will go ahead and come up. There are many ways in which we worship the Lord. Worship, in both Greek and Hebrew words, is a term that emphasizes the recognition of divine authority, the sovereignty of God over all of his creation, as we demonstrate our submission to who he is and what he has provided for us. Giving is part of worship, just as prayer, singing, the study of God's Word, and the application of God's Word are also a part of worship. Scripture teaches that that giving is not something we do in order to get something from God or to somehow manipulate Him into blessing us, but because we have, from the point of our salvation, been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, and that God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness, 
God has already given us everything, and we respond in gratitude and grace to what he has provided and supplied us. Giving, therefore, is something that is to be motivated by our own uh, our own spiritual maturity, our own response to God's grace, and to in a way to honor and glorify him. At the conference, we take up the offering to defray the expenses of the conference. As George pointed out earlier, as he was talking about an elder uh, who rules well is worthy of double honor. In that same passage, Paul says that we're not supposed to muzzle the ox while he is threshing. He uses that passage from Deuteronomy to speak of the fact that, that a pastor is worthy of his pay. And so those who come and present, those who have labored in the Word of God, uh, should be honored and taken care of for that. And so we always give a uh, stipend and honorarium to each of the uh, presenters. And so part of the offering goes to that. Part of it goes to just defraying other expenses. Uh, we usually take up offering in relation to all three organizations present, West Houston Bible Church, uh, Dean Bible Ministries that handles all of the media aspects of the conference, as well as Chafer Theological Seminary. So you can make out your checks to any one of those uh, three entities or your gifts to any of those three uh, entities as you give over the course of this uh, conference as we worship the Lord through giving. Scripture says, As every man purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a generous, grace-oriented giver. As uh, the men come forward to take up the offering... Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our Father, it's just such a tremendous blessing that we have to study your word, to reflect upon the implications of your word for how we we worship, how we sing, how we do everything in life, that we may come to, uh, through a study of your word, come to think about reality as you have made it and not as fallen creatures wish it to be. Uh, Father, we're thankful that you have given us the great privilege during this week to fellowship with one another around the teaching of your word and for all the ways that you have supplied and provided for us. And now we give these gifts as simply an expression of our appreciation for all that you have done for us and our desire to support uh, this conference, the ministries represented that have put this on, and our desire to make sure that your word goes forth Uh, unhindered by financial uh, obligations. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Some of you were not here this afternoon when Scott began uh, teaching us on the uh, topic of, uh, of music and how to understand, evaluate, and think about music as something that communicates, not just in terms of the words, but also in terms of the music itself. And if you were not here this afternoon, did not hear that, that will be available, both the video and the audio, on the uh, Dean Bible website under the Chafer Seminary Conference uh, uh, link. And so I encourage you to listen to that. It was just a tremendous introduction, and he laid down some very important, significant principles. For those of you who weren't here, Scott is the author of two books, uh, Worship in Song, A Biblical Approach to Music and Worship, and Sound Worship, A Guide to Making Musical Choices in a Noisy World. His books are available in the um, in the front, all the way farthest room possible, and you can go back there and look at some of the material that he has uh, there. He is uh, well qualified to speak on the topic he's addressing because of his background and formal education in, in theology, in philosophy, as well as in music. And I have said for years that you cannot think, opine, or discuss intelligently the issues related to music unless you have some control over all three of those disciplines. Many people who just like to strum guitars don't understand that, but that if you're going to really think about these things honestly and seek the truth and what's best for God, you have to control those disciplines, and Scott does. And he just has a tremendous way of communicating. So I'm going to ask him to come up now and continue uh, teaching on music and communication of music. <laughs> well, I'd like to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles this evening to the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. I want to once again express my appreciation for the invitation to be here uh, these few days and have enjoyed getting to know some of you and look forward to getting to know even more of you over the next couple of days. What I'd like to do this evening is to address what I really believe is at the center of the whole debate about music and worship. There are many ways of addressing this issue, some of which we'll do this week. Uh, addressing it from the angle of musical communication, which we did this, this, this afternoon, uh, addressing it from the angle of aesthetics and beauty, which we will do tomorrow, and looking at the issue of culture, which we will do on Wednesday evening. But really, the center and the foundation of differences over what kind of music we choose for worship really finds their root in how we define worship in the first place. We could all this evening agree together about what particular musical styles communicate. We could agree completely and yet violently disagree over what is appropriate for worship if our understandings of what worship is are different. And so I believe it's essential as we try to think through of issues related to worship and music that we spend some time and consider how the Bible itself defines worship. What is the essence of of worship, and in particular, Christian worship, as defined by the Bible itself. Well, there are a number of places we could go in Scripture in order to discover the essence of worship, but I believe there's perhaps no more thorough discussion in our New Testament of Christian worship, and really in all of Scripture, than in the book of Hebrews. In fact, I would suggest to you that, that a major theme, if not the primary theme of the book of Hebrews, is worship. And in this sense, really, the book of Hebrews serves as a textbook for us in our understanding of what Christian worship is, similar to how the books of the Chronicles are sort of the textbook of Old Testament worship. And so it's to that book that I'd like to draw our attention this evening as we seek to understand the nature and the essence of of Christian worship. And so I'd like to read Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19, and we'll read uh, through verse 25. The author writes, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, 
having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Here at the end of Hebrews 10, we find three admonitions that are introduced by the phrase, let us. We have, let us draw near, let us hold fast the confession of our hope, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds. And it is to the first of these commands that I'd like to draw our attention this evening. This idea of drawing near is an important focus of the book of Hebrews. It's, it's riddled throughout the book and in particular in the literary climaxes of the book of Hebrews. Scholars tell us that Hebrews has primarily three literary climaxes. Here in chapter 10, verse 22, we find the second of the literary climaxes of the book of Hebrews. The first is found in chapter 4, verse 16, which says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And the verb translated come in chapter 4, verse 16, is the same term, translated draw near in our text in chapter 10. So we have these parallel ideas in the first two climactic sections of the book of Hebrews. And the final climax of the book is found in chapter 12, verse 22, which says, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. And again, the phrase you have come is a trans, translation of proserkomai, the same term that we see in all three of these climaxes of the book of Hebrews. So we see this idea of drawing near to God as a very important concept in this book. And not only is this concept in the three primary literary climaxes of the book of Hebrews, but it appears in several other places as well. In chapter 7, chapter 10, chapter 11, all of these passages in the book of Hebrews focus our attention on the call to draw near to God, the basis to draw near to God, and the means for drawing near. This, this concept of drawing near to God is critical to this book. So what, what is important about this command? We have in our text this evening, let us draw near. What is, the, what is the importance of that? What does drawing near mean? Well, this idea of coming or drawing near is a translation of this Greek term that means more than just a casual coming t- towards something. But rather, as William Lane tells us, it is exclusively used as an approach to God. And we can see that how it's used throughout the book. Every time you find the term, it specifically refers to coming toward God himself. We find commands to draw near to God, to draw near to the throne of grace. And here in our text, verse 19 implies that we draw near to the the holiest, the, the holy place. So it is clear that this drawing near is coming to God. And throughout the book of Hebrews, the author compares this idea of drawing near to Hebrew worship practices. They're they're, they're in our text as well. The term translated holiest here is is literally the holy place of the temple. We also find temple terms like the veil, high priest, sprinkling, and washing. Each of these Old Testament worship terms are meant to paint pictures in our mind of worship as we consider this idea of drawing near to God. In other words, this concept of drawing near to God is how the author of Hebrews defines worship. This idea of drawing near to God is really what permeates the the storyline of Scripture. It's what Adam and Eve enjoyed as they walked with God in the cool of the day. It's described in Exodus chapter 19 when Moses brought the people to the the foot of Mount Sinai to meet God. He had told Pharaoh that, that he should let his people go so that they might go in the wilderness and worship God, and that's exactly what they intended to do. It's what Psalm 100 commands of the Hebrews in the temple when it says, come into his presence with singing and into his courts with praise. It's what Isaiah experienced in chapter 6 when he entered the heavenly throne room of God and saw him high and lifted up. To draw near to God is to enter his very presence and to delight in his glory. And that's what God is calling us to do in this text. Draw near to God. We don't come to worship of our own initiative. 
We come on the invitation of God himself. He wants us to draw near to him. But of course, any reader of this command immediately recognizes his inherent problem. This God to whom we are supposed to draw near is holy. He is without sin and he cannot tolerate sin, and yet we are sinful. We have no right to draw near to God because of our sin. The fall of mankind into sin really destroyed the possibility to draw near to him. After Adam and Eve sinned, they they no longer enjoyed that privilege of walking with God in the cool of the garden. Instead, they hid from him in fear and desperately tried to cover their guilt with leaves. And ever since that time, any attempt to draw near to God results in a profound recognition of guilt and unworthiness. We are not worthy to draw near to God. The Israelites experienced this when they drew near to Mount Sinai, when they witnessed the holiness of God and his majesty and his greatness at the foot of that mountain. They trembled with fear and begged that Moses go on their behalf. They couldn't stand it. This is the reason that although God inhabited the holy place of the tabernacle and later the temple, no person could enter his presence except for the high priest and that only once a year on the Day of Atonement. This is what Isaiah experienced when he saw the Lord high and lifted up in all of his glory and his holiness. And Isaiah cried out and said, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. He saw the king and he recognized his unworthiness to be in his presence. You see, the problem with the command in Hebrews chapter 10 is that we have no right to draw near to God. Our sin prohibits entrance into a holy God's presence. The only way that God enabled people to partially draw near is through the temporary sacrifices, and even then there are barriers. There's the outer court, there's the temple walls, there's the veil of separation. People could not enter the presence of God. And we know what happens when people disobey those commands, right? Remember Uzzah? He reached out with apparently good motives to study that ark, and he's killed for daring to touch that place of God's presence. These people had no access, no direct access. In fact, we have in our Old Testament an account of a man who dared to enter the presence of the Lord. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, we have the record of King Uzziah. And for the most part, the text tells us that Uzziah was a good king. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and God rewarded him, gave him many military victories, But the text tells us that when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Here was a great man, a a righteous man, a leader of God's people, but even he did not have the right to enter God's presence. And when he dared enter God's presence, leprosy immediately spread across his forehead. And the priests dragged him out of that place. He was not worthy. As great a man as he was, he wasn't worthy to enter the presence of God. The point is, we can't obey this command. Here is a command, draw near to God. The essence of what worship is, and we as sinful human beings have no right to do this. But of course, our text provides us the solution to this problem. And it provides us the solution through two purpose clauses. The first is found in verse 19. The text literally reads, Since we have boldness to enter the holy place, draw near to God. This idea of of boldness and confidence is an expression of free and open access. Since we have free and open access to God, Draw near to him. So this verse is specifically addressing our problem. God commands us to draw near, yet because of our sin, we don't have access to him. But this verse tells us that such access is possible. It is possible to have access to the very holy place of God himself. And here's the first term that's meant to to conjure up worship imagery in our minds. The holy place was that most sacred of places in the temple. That place that no one was enabled to enter except for the high priest and once a year. And there were barriers preventing people progressively from entering that presence of God. 
In fact, even in Jerusalem today, there's a, there's a place marked on the ground where they believe the holy place to be that says, if you're a Jew, don't step here. There was such a significance placed on that presence of God and a recognition that we are not worthy to step in that place. But this verse tells us that we have access not just to the outer court, not just to the entrance of the temple, but beyond the veil into the very presence of God himself. And how can that be? We'll keep reading. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Access to God is possible through a sacrifice, and this is no ordinary sacrifice. This is the vicarious substitutionary atonement of the Son of God himself. At the beginning of Hebrews 10, the author revealed the insufficiency of animal sacrifices to purify those who attempt to draw near. But this text tells us that one sacrifice can perfect those who draw near, and it is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is fully man, he can stand as our substitute. And because he is fully God, he can pay the eternal punishment that we cannot pay. And because of the perfection and eternality of this sacrifice, it need not be offered day after day after day as those sacrifices were in the Old Testament. It is offered one time and the complete wrath of God is appeased. This is what God pictured when he slew that animal in the garden and and covered Adam and Eve's guilt. This is what was pictured when Moses offered a sacrifice at the foot of Mount Sinai so that the elders of the people could dare approach God. This is what was pictured each year in Israel on the Day of Atonement when an animal was sacrificed and the high priest entered that holy place and sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. This is what was pictured when the seraph took that burning coal from the altar and placed it on Isaiah's lips and said, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And this is pictured perhaps no more beautifully than what happened at the moment of Christ's death on the cross. The gospel accounts of the crucifixion tell us that Jesus cried with a loud voice and he gave up his spirit. And at that exact moment, the veil of the temple was torn in two as if that veil was the flesh of Christ himself. No longer was there separation between man and God. That separation had been removed by Christ and his sacrifice. There is now a new and living way to God. And that way is his son. Christ and his sacrifice is what makes worship possible. This phrase, new and living way, I think paints a beautiful picture as well. This word new here is not a typical word that would be used for something that's just new, like a a new car or, or or a new dress. This is a word that literally means freshly slaughtered. He was freshly slaughtered and yet living. He rose from the dead, having defeated sin and death, and now we have access into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a freshly slaughtered and yet living way. Therefore, therefore, because of the reality of all of that, draw near in worship. But there's another since clause that explains to us how we have access to God, and that's found in verse 21. It literally reads, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, draw near. Of course, in the Old Testament economy, the only person enabled to actually enter the presence of God, and that only once a year, was that high priest. But this verse tells us that not only is Jesus the perfect sacrifice that gains us access to God, he is also the high priest who offers the sacrifice. He is the priest and victim. And now, because of our relationship to this great high priest, we can draw near in worship. Hebrews 7.25 emphasizes the fact that Christ's high priestly ministry of intercession makes this approach possible. It says, Wherefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near, same term, to God through him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So God commands us to draw near in worship to him. Because of our guilt and our sin, this is only possible through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf and through Christ's high priestly ministry. Jesus Christ is the only basis for drawing near to God in worship. 
Now allow me to move for a moment from principle to application here. This recognition that Christian worship is possible only by gaining access through Jesus Christ may seem to you to be an important idea, but one that has very little direct practical application, right? On the contrary, I believe that this should have profound implications for how we worship. This should at very least have implication for how we plan and order our worship services. Unfortunately, due to many factors today, worship services are planned and patterned more after services designed to attract unbelievers rather than designing the service to facilitate Christians worshiping their God through their relationship to Jesus Christ. Certainly, every service can have, should have the gospel as part of it and, and, and should perhaps have an evangelistic appeal. But in many ways, out of good motivation to, to give the gospel to unbelievers, we have actually lost the kind of drawing near to God through Christ in worship that this text is talking about. Instead, many church services week after week after week are evangelistic services or revival meetings instead of gatherings of God's people to draw near to him through Christ. And this significantly affects the kinds of music and the kinds of of structures we have in our services. Instead, I believe we need to consider worship as that time in which God's people draw near to him through Christ. Christ. And that very act is a proclamation of the gospel. That very act is a display, a marvelous display of what the gospel enables and is itself evangelistic. But our text doesn't only explain to us the basis for drawing near to God in worship, it also tells us the means of drawing near. The text commands us in verse 22 draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. The basis for drawing near to God is the sacrifice of Christ, but the means for drawing near is sincerity of heart and faith in Christ. This idea of of true means, means real or sincere. God does not want worshipers who come out of habit or out of duty. He wants those who come out of sincerity and a deep longing for communion with him through his word. But not only are we to draw near with a sincere heart, we are to draw near in full assurance of faith. And it is here that I want to park for a few moments. I believe that this issue, drawing near to God in our worship through faith, is at the heart of problems with worship today. In order to explain what I mean, we need to consider further what this idea of drawing near to God in faith means. Of course, we need look no further than the book of Hebrews to get a a great definition of what faith is, particularly in chapter 11. In chapter 11, verse 1, the author tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11.6 emphasizes the need for faith in drawing near to God in worship. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh, same Greek term, for he that draws near to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So this is the essence of faith. Faith is believing, having confidence in something that we cannot see. You see, this God to whom we are drawing near in worship obviously is one we can't see. He is spirit. We cannot see him, and yet we are to draw near to him. We don't experience God with our physical senses. We don't see him. And so the only means to draw near in worship to him is to do so through faith with a full confidence and assurance that he exists and that he will reward those who seek him, with full confidence of his promise that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. Leon Morris comments, There are realities for which we have no material evidence, though they are not less real for that. 
Faith enables us to know that they exist. While we have no certainty apart from faith, faith does give us genuine certainty. Faith is the basis of all the Christian life means, all the Christian life hopes for, and I would add, including drawing near in worship. You see, drawing near to God through Christ by faith means that we don't depend upon any physical evidence for assurance that we are truly worshiping. And that's key. Let me say that again. To draw near to God through Christ by faith means that we do not depend upon any physical evidence that we are truly worshiping. To worship in faith means that we do not define worship by a physical experience, by a feeling, or by any tangible proof. To worship in faith means that we follow the biblical instructions that have been given to us to draw near to God, to sing to him, to give to him, to hear from his word, And then we simply trust that if we follow his word and we draw near to him through faith, then we truly are worshiping regardless of any physical factors. Worship is not tied to any physical location, to any ritual, to any ceremony, to any element, or any feeling. Worship is simply a spiritual drawing near to God through Jesus Christ. And in order to do this, we must have a full assurance of faith. This has not always been so. Yes, worship has always been at its essence a heart response of giving due honor to the Lord. But for the Jews under the Mosaic system, when the veil of separation between men and the presence of God was still intact, worship was tied to a specific location and rituals and other physical experiences. But once Christ came, Once God in flesh drew near to his people, once Jesus Christ himself became the sacrifice and the veil was torn in two, worship became no longer tied to that temple. Christ said it so himself in John 4 when he said, The hour cometh and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. That is something inward and immaterial and truth, an understanding of God as he expresses himself in his word. Something similar is expressed in the final climax of the book of Hebrews at the end of chapter chapter 12. The author says in chapter 12, verse 18, for you are not come, same same Greek Greek word we've been looking at, proserkomai, you have not come unto the mount that may be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and to the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words. You see, the author here is using Mount Sinai as a representative example of the essence of worship under the Mosaic law. Notice how the author describes Old Testament worship. It's physical. It can be touched. There are visual sensations, burning fire and darkness and gloom and storm. It has oral sensations, the the sound of a trumpet blast and actual words spoken from God himself. In other words, that worship was very sensory. We naturally think of this when we consider Old Testament worship. This was a beautiful tabernacle and then a temple where where you you could see the worship. There was incense and burnt offerings. You could smell that worship. There was elaborate priestly adornments and gold and fine linens. You could could sense all of these things. You actually had to lay your hand on that animal. You could feel that worship. This created an experience of the senses. But it was a frightening experience, according to Hebrews chapter 12. It was frightening. The people begged that, that Moses go on their behalf, but... But perhaps it was in some ways more real. You actually had a a physical experience when you worshipped. I can resonate with this. A number of years ago, I was speaking in Florida, and the pastor took me to the Holy Land experience in Orlando, sort of a theme park uh, that has bible theme sort of things. It actually has a pretty interesting collection of of, uh, Bible texts. One of the things they had there was a life-size replica of the tabernacle. 
You go in there and somebody gives a lecture about the Day of Atonement and what would happen. And then they actually reproduced what it would have been like to be there on the Day of Atonement. With all of the smells and bells and, and lightning from heaven and all of this and the, and the, fire being cons- uh, the sacrifice being consumed. And let me tell you, it, it felt like worship. With all of those sense experiences. It was exciting. I got goosebumps. It felt religious. But this author says, because of Christ, you have not drawn near to that mountain. But rather, in verse 22, you have drawn near unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Worship is no longer tied to an earthly physical location now because Jesus Christ is our high priest. We actually, in him, enter the worship that is already taking place in heaven. Ephesians tells us that we are seated with him in the heavenlies. Because of our relationship with him, we are not yet there physically, but spiritually we join in with the angel chorus that we sang about a few moments ago. But the problem is that we're physical beings and and we naturally want something physical to to grip onto. We naturally want to be able to point to something, whether it's a place or a ceremony or a ritual or a feeling. We want to be able to point to something and say, that's worship. And so when we attempt to obey this command to draw near in worship and nothing physical happens, We don't get a buzz. We don't have a warm, squishy feeling. We wonder, have I really worshipped? We depend on the physical. And then we end up needing other things to give us the confidence that we're really worshipping. Whether it's a kind of stimulating music that moves us, or whether it's a kind of atmosphere that creates a certain aura, and we say, yeah, that's worship or a particular place. And if we don't have those things, if we don't have that stimulating music, then we really don't feel like we're worshiping. I just don't feel like I've worshiped. But the author in chapter 10 commands us to draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith in things that we do not experience with the physical senses. This doesn't mean feelings or physical expressions are bad. We're physical beings. God has made us to feel and to express ourselves physically. And it doesn't mean that there will be no feelings that accompany worship. There there likely will be to one degree or another. But we must be willing to make a distinction between the, the, the spiritual affections that are produced by the Holy Spirit of God as we draw near to God through Christ by faith and physical feelings that are merely stimulated artificially. We must distinguish between the spiritual affections and mere physical feelings. Jonathan Edwards distinguished between the religious affections and the physical passions that he said are actually signs of nothing. The New Testament authors made this kind of distinction as well, and they used Greek anatomical terms as metaphors. They called the spiritual affections the chest, the splankna, and they called the visceral passions the belly, the koilia. For instance, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 that enemies of Christ worship their koilia, their belly, their God is their belly. In Colossians 3, Paul tells Christians to put on the splankna, the chest, the, the bowels in the King James, put on the affections of mercy, of kindness, of humbleness of mind, meekness and long-suffering. They didn't believe the passions were evil, but only unbelievers feed their passions and allow themselves to be controlled by them while Christians nurture spiritual, noble, religious affections. Unfortunately, this distinction has been lost in our day. But it was maintained for thousands of years. In more recent times, as I mentioned, Jonathan Edwards, I think, best best articulated this distinction in his book, The Religious Affections. 
Edwards defined affection as the inclination of the will. It is what moves us to do what we know is right. He, he defined affections as, a, as an element of the mind, the immaterial part of man. On the other hand, he defined passion as the agent which immediately affected the animal spirits. In other words, the physical feelings and impulses that we share with animals. Goosebumps, exhilaration, the chemical production of our glands. He said this, the affections and passions are frequently spoken of as the same. Even in his time, this distinction was being blurred. And yet in the more common use of speech, there is in some respect a difference. Affection is a word that in the ordinary signification seems to be something more extensive than passion, being used for all the vigorous, lively actings of the will and inclination. But passion for those things that are more sudden, and whose effect on the animal spirits are more violent and the mind more overpowered and less in its own command. Folks, I think this is a distinction that has been lost but critically needs to be recovered. Let me see if I can try to explain to you a little further what I mean by this distinction. The difference between feelings that are merely chemical responses to a stimulus and feelings that have been produced by true spiritual affections is like the difference between laughing because you've been tickled and laughing because I tell you a joke. When I, when I tickle my children, they have a physical response, but nothing is going on in their mind. It's not as if they're laying there saying, my father is tickling me, therefore I will laugh. No, it's simply a chemical involuntary response. On the other hand, if I tell you a joke and it's a good one, you have the same physical response of laughter, but something has to happen first before that response comes. You have to get the punchline, right? Or here's another illustration. When I was in college, I lived in a dorm, and one night just before uh, going to, to bed, I ran down the hall to get a drink of water, and I ran back to my room, closed the door, shut off my light, and dove into my bunk bed. Well, what I didn't know was that while I was down the hall getting that drink of water, my good friend Mike had snuck into my room, had snuck into my bed, and was hiding at the bottom corner of my bed. So I came in, turned the light off, shut the door, dove in, didn't know he was there, was just beginning to drift off into blissful slumber when, boo! And folks, let me tell you, at that moment, I had a feeling of exhilaration. But there was nothing going on in my mind when that happened. It was merely an involuntary chemical response to an external stimulus. You see, because of this, distinct, this lack of distinction between mere chemical responses and true spiritual affections that may produce feelings, because that has been lost... Christians today have begun to define the spiritual experience by the physical feeling. And this has been happening throughout the history of the church. Christians have always been tempted to follow after more physical, more sensory forms of worship. For example, one of the factors I think that led to problems with the Roman Catholic Church was that in their fusion, in their equation of the church and Israel, they began to introduce into Christian worship those elements of worship that were for Israel. They introduced an altar. They established priests with beautiful robes and trappings, and they began to light candles and incense and have all of these ceremonies and rituals. And the sacrificial system became the mass, and the circumcision became infant baptism. Their problem, of course, was theological, but in essence, it was their, their natural desire for tangible, physical, sensory worship. Worship that you could touch and, and smell and that created an experience of the senses. Well, some of the reformers came along and said, no, worship is not supposed to be physical. Worship is spiritual. And so they got rid of all the pomp and the rituals and the, the incense and the candles and the priests and the sacrifices. Now, the Reformation happened gradually. The Lutherans and Anglicans made the fewest changes. Presbyterians and Puritans made a few more. And the good dispensationalists have made the most changes to return us to biblical worship. 
During Jonathan Edwards' lifetime, we find a beginning of another shift to define Christian worship as spirit as, as physical. The awakening that occurred under his preaching was truly, purely spiritual. He says it was a surprising work of God. But when the people saw what was happening, many people began to define what was going on by some of the physical excesses. So by the time of Charles Finney, many Christians defined Christian experience by external, physical, sensory kinds of experiences. They began to say things like, there must be excitement sufficient to wake up the dormant moral powers. But now, instead of using rituals and incense and ceremonies to create physical sensory experiences, they began to use certain kinds of music, emotionalistic preaching, exciting new measures to create these kinds of experiences. The charismatic movement is another example of desiring physical experiences of worship instead of the simple, spiritual, immaterial worship. Charismatic theology teaches that external physical signs will accompany true spiritual experience. They inexorably link physical feelings to spirituality. The point is this. Throughout the history of the church, people have naturally wanted a physical experience to define their worship. But our text tells us that this worship is not defined by the physical. It will be there. We're physical beings. But it's not the essence of what worship is. Unfortunately, when people worship today, they really want to feel something. They want to experience something. They want to encounter God. They want passionate, engaging worship. They want something physical. And said, Instead of rituals and incense, they use pop music and drama and humor and video and light and smoke and all of these things to create a physical experience of the senses. And we need to be careful, I think, not just to point out there to them. I mean, how many times have you thought in your heart, I just don't feel like I'm worshiping? I've thought that. But folks, the point is, when we desire some kind of physical experience in worship, we are desiring law and not grace. Law is physical. Grace is spiritual. We are desiring the kind of worship that existed before people could actually approach, could actually boldly come to God through Christ. If we cannot draw near to God in worship simply with nothing more than faith in Jesus Christ, then perhaps we're not worshiping at all. Certainly when we worship, there will be physical feelings to one degree or another. But we cannot define the essence of worship by a feeling. Feelings are not the aim and goal of worship And therefore, we must not define worship by some sort of physical passion or feeling. And we must be wary of elements in our music, or in our worship, including certain kinds of music, that were created simply for the purpose of stimulating visceral passions. As Christians, we worship by faith and not by sight. We worship by faith and not by feeling. So, Let me summarize, and then I think we'll have a few moments for for questions. True True Christian worship takes place when believers draw near to God through Christ by faith. That's the essence of worship. This means that we are not looking for simply an effect. We are looking for true communion with God through a deeper knowledge of him as we learn about him in his word. This means that even good biblical truth mixed with music that simply creates a physical experience of the passions is failure to worship by faith. It means that good biblical truth must be married with music that modestly supports that truth in an appropriate way. 
And so my burden for us this evening is that we make it our ambition to structure our services so that the service itself proclaims that we are worshiping through Christ. And let's conduct our services from the preaching to the scripture reading to the music in such a way that we grow to know God more deeply rather than simply creating a passionate atmosphere. Can we pray together and then we'll have a time of Q&A? Father, we confess this evening that we are unworthy to draw near to you of our own. But we praise you that because of the sacrificial atonement of your Son, Jesus Christ, those of us who put our faith and confidence in him may boldly draw near to you through his blood. I thank you for the privilege you have given us to worship in spirit and truth to draw closer to a knowledge of you as it is expressed through the truth of your word. But we also confess tonight that we we as physical beings with God-given bodies often depend upon physical proof. And so I ask that, that that you would motivate us not to depend on those things that we would simply draw near to you through the teaching and preaching of your word by faith, trusting you that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us as you have promised. Help us not to to desire those sorts of elements, whether it be music or other things that that simply create an atmosphere or, or stimulate our senses. Help us to desire your truth and to respond when we understand that truth with hearts of gratitude and thanksgiving and praise. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right. Questions? You got a question? I could just tell by the way you looked at me. <laughs> Again, uh, thanks. This was this was awesome, and everybody in the room is uh, having that moment of pause after the amen, where we're taking it in and kind of soaking in it. And so I have to ask my question before I even know really how to say it. Uh, but I do have a question that I want to say uh, to ask you. Um, when um, when we um, make this distinction between the uh, the corporate worship that you have defined. I think you, your talk has been on corporate worship that, like we're having tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, in the worldview movement, you get this uh, anti um, sort of Kantian division of life where we we put things in the sacred box and in the secular box. We're trying to tear that down, and I hear that in the secular sort of emerging church mm-hmm, movement mm-hmm. that we're, we're tearing down the secular and yep. sacred, so we show up in flip-flops and baggy shorts to preach because, well, it's dishonest to wear a suit to preach in since sometimes we wear shorts and, and flip-flops, right. and so we're supposed to dumb down. And but, um, but on the other hand, the conservatives are saying, no, we, we mustn't uh, divide the secular from the – I mean, sorry, the – the sacred parts of our life from, from the other aspects of our life because we compartmentalize. Yeah. So what, I, what I'm getting at is, do you see a difference between what you've defined as corporate worship where we draw near in faith and, and this more formal approach mm-hmm. and the rest of life, which the words for worship seem to be about submission of life. Yeah. So could you talk about the general worship of life as opposed to the special occasional worship? Yeah, great question. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting because you're right. The emergent missional guys today want to say, hey, all of life is worship. There's no distinction. And what that means for them is not a heightening of all of life to be holy. It's a degrading of corporate worship to all of life, right? So I, I, I see that as a problem. On the other hand, I do in one sense, agree, all of life is or should be worship. Um, All of life for a believer should be a response of who we are to truth 
about God. So I would agree with that that sentiment that it's not you know we're not worshiping on Sunday morning and then the rest of life is is open you know open game. Uh, Romans twelve one and two right offer your bodies living sacrifices of worship. That's not specifically talking about corporate worship. That's talking about our lives. So I think there are many cases in which our discussions of worship uh, uh, apply to the the entirety of our lives. Having said that, I I, I would not. Um, uh, get rid of, however, a, a distinction about certain events like the corporate gathering of the church, which is distinct from the rest of life. So that doesn't mean that, we, that, the, that the rest of life is up for grabs. It means now we are gathering for a specific purpose to hear from God through his word, and to respond to him in praise. This is something distinct. It's something special. If you want to use the word sacred, I think it's a good word to use. It, sacred, what does it mean? Simply set apart, right? This is not, there, there, are, there are, in other words, this is a time in which uh, I, I wouldn't do some things. You know, um, I bathe my children, and that's an act of worship, but I wouldn't do that in the corporate gathering of the church, you know, um, to use one example I read recently. Uh, and so, um, so on the one hand, I want to affirm the idea that all of life is worship. On the other hand, I do not want to get rid of the idea that there is a, that there is a, a sacred aspect of corporate worship when the church gathers. And I think you know, some of the language that the New Testament uses for the church um, to call us a temple, um, not, not only individuals but the body, uh, some of the things that we do, even in the book of Hebrews, you know, lifting uh, uh, lips of praise and sacrifice to the Lord. I think th- these authors use this language specifically to say, hey, there's something special about this. It's not, it's not equivalent to what happened in the Old Testament temple, but we're using these metaphors to say this is something holy and sacred. Um, so I, don't think, I, don't, I think we need both, you know. So can you talk about the—this um, is a follow-on. Yeah, yeah. To apply what you're what you're saying, could we could we talk about the times we're not in corporate worship for what's in your on, on the uh, on the rubric? What's appropriate? Yeah, right. What's so fitting, those kinds of things. Because if absolutely. life is worship and some things aren't appropriate for worship, then we have to be sequestered. <laughs> yeah, right. So so life is worship, which which simply means you know in in when I'm when I'm mowing my lawn, I, I am doing it to the glory of God. When I'm you know whatever I'm doing, when I'm listening to Music, that is an act of worship. It's not as narrowly focused as the corporate setting of God's people. So I can listen to, you know, some Mozart piano concerto, which I wouldn't use in worship. It's not fitting for that. But I, in my lifestyle worship framework, say this is expressing something noble. So, um, so the, in other words, the criteria, I think, narrow much more when we get to corporate worship than all of life, but that still doesn't mean everything goes. It, it, it simply means the criteria is broader. Um, having said that, I will also say, though, even outside of corporate worship, when I'm listening to sacred music, in other words, music that carries a scriptural text, I'm going to be, again, more careful. It's not corporate worship, but it's still God's word than if it's a text about family and love and life. You know, So... In other words, it's all about appropriateness in those cases to to the occasion or to the content. Great questions. Um, I picked up on your on your statement that um, corporate worship in church is a demonstration of what the gospel enables. Mm -hmm. Help us to think about um, using pagan music forms as an avenue for the gospel. Yeah, well, uh, to use a a musical form that expresses, we could put it this way, values of paganism, uh, even according according to what we talked about this, this afternoon, would be unfitting for the expression of God's truth. And again, some of that is symptomatic to this idea that every service becomes an evangelistic meeting, and so we're trying to attract unbelievers with what they like. Well, not only are we losing worship, but we're also sort of bait and switching. You know? And we are trying to communicate holy truth in, uh, in methods that are unfitting for that content. 
So there's almost three problems, <laughs> at least, with, with that. So, I mean, does that sort of answer yeah, your saying? Serving up a nice softball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, by, by saying, I didn't, I didn't get into this just for sake of time, but by saying that our worship itself proclaims the gospel, um, I would recommend Brian Chappell's book, Christ-Centered Worship. And in that book, I don't agree with everything, but he, what, he, what he does is he shows how worship services throughout history have been ordered in such a way that really are a shape of the gospel. In other words, we, we, we come in and we have a call to worship. In other words, we're affirming God is the one who, who initiates this. And then, uh, and then we, we adore him for his greatness. And then perhaps we have a time of, of personal confession of sin to acknowledge we're unworthy to be here, but then an affirmation, we're here because of the blood of Christ. So you know, forgiveness through him. And then a time of thanks and then hearing from him. And so this very progression of the service itself not only is, uh, accomplishes believers actually worshiping the Lord, but is itself a proclamation of the gospel. Um, anyway, it, it, it's not enough time to get into all of what he says there, but it's, it's well worth reading. Um, and, and, and a way in which we can preserve a, a Sunday morning service as truly worship, but yet if an unbeliever is here, he may, 1 Corinthians 14, fall on his face before God and say, God is truly among you. you know? If we can both worship and um, be evangelistic. Do you, do you think we've reached a point in American culture at this modern time when uh, believers who truly desire to worship God the proper way, the fitting way, the honorable way, the virtuous way, have become such a, a small minority of, of our population that... Um, that that by not using gimmicks, in other words, that that this is just a reflection of the negative volition of the people in our country, and 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 if we do it right, no matter what, they're not they're not going to come to us. Yeah. Um. Let, let me just say this before I answer the question. I, I do want to make clear, you know, as I've defined worship tonight, worship is drawing near through Christ on his merits, right? Um, God, we do not earn any merit. I, I just want to make this clear. We all know this, but I want to affirm this. We do not earn any merit with God by using the right music, right? It's Christ's merits. Um, so I want to make that clear. However, um, when we emotionally manipulate, when we create services designed to appeal to unbelievers, when we capitulate to the culture, um, that is not to say that God is not displeased, right? Um, he, he accepts us because of Christ, but he can still be displeased with his children. And I think we have to affirm both of those. Uh, so to answer your question, I mean, I, um, I consider myself part of a very small minority. You know, uh, we've, we've allowed big business to shape our, our ministry mindset rather than the word. We've allowed culture's values, which we'll talk about Wednesday night, to shape our sentiments rather than the word. <laughs> We've allowed all kinds of other things, marketing techniques, um, all of these things to shape how we do church rather than the word. And I think we need to get back to the word to shape us. Coming off of what Bob asked, do you see any reversal, any sign that there are younger uh, generation, 20, 30-somethings that are beginning to recognize the the, the vacuousness of mm -hmm. contemporary worship and the contemporary church? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I see that in a, in a number of ways. I see some, uh, even within the contemporary worship scene, who at least are recognizing the shallowness of the lyrics for so many years. And there's, an, there's a, a, an improvement in at least lyrics and a, um, a movement towards more congregational 
singing rather than performance, lights and smoke. So I think there, even within the contemporary scene, there are some good things happening. Now, I would urge them to move even further and consider the actual forms of music they're using, but they're moving, you know, I think, in the right direction. And there are some. There are some um, you know, uh, of my generation who have sort of hit bottom and recognized the futility of what's happening and, um, and are starting to regain some of these principles. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's why I travel and speak and write, because I, I want to help this, this movement, and, and there are some. We need to hear a solo rendition of Do Lord before you answer your question. <laughs> uh, a, question you? a question for you. Uh, Christ centered worship by Brian, whom? Chapel. Chapel. And a statement for Dr. Dean. I've been coming to pastors' conferences for about 40 years off and on. This is the very best first day of any conference I've ever been to. Thank you. (laughs) But we know you have Alzheimer's and you don't remember (laughs) yesterday. (laughs) For those of you who don't know, Hence and I go back, I think I met him when I was nine years old, so we have a... uh, certain jesting that goes on because we've been around each other way too long. Scott, night, thank you for uh, sharing with us. Um, I'm a 30-something, so from the 30-somethings, there are times when I would actually like to maybe lift up my hands like this while we sing. I probably wouldn't do that, but there might be some times when I wish I could. And there might be some times when I wish I could clap my hands. And my three-year-old daughter, uh, we, we went to a Messianic Jewish church for a few uh, weeks, and they do Davidic dance up in the front. And maybe for a couple different songs, they'll kind of make a big circle and hold hands. I don't know if any of you have seen that. My daughter asked me, begs me to do that uh, during our, our uh, worship service at Todd's church. And I always have to tell her no. And I know that if I raise my hand or do this, I'll probably be asked to leave (laughs) in most of y'all's churches. So is it possible that we can take it too far? We don't want to be a stumbling block to our more emotional neighbors, perhaps, but my mind is engaged. I'm worshiping the Lord. I want to lift up my hands about waist high. So so what about that? Yes. Why? Because my body posture, there are certain body postures at certain times that could perhaps perhaps help me focus more. Um, You know, body language can, I could have my hands in my pockets or I could close my eyes and I could lift up my hands halfway. I don't, my purpose isn't to... Uh, distract someone else, but at the same time, I don't get the chance to worship God in a corporate setting all the time. So I enjoy it. I think it's an enjoyable thing to worship the Lord perhaps that way. Maybe that's the best answer. Um, Okay, so a couple things. Um, Obviously, we have some admonitions to raise hands, even in the Psalms, um, even in the New Testament. Uh, so I, I don't think I would ever say it is wrong to raise one's hands. Again, my question would be why? Because my experience has been that for most people, the reason they want to raise their hands is because they've been worked up into sort of an emotional experience, and that's just one of the things that happens. So, so for instance, I've been to conferences before where they've had these big emotional charismatic type Songs and everybody's raising their hands, 
because that's what the music does. And then all of a sudden, everything quiets down, and it's just piano and holy, 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 and all the hands goes down, go down. And that tells me this is not about... Um, th- th- this, is, this is about the music doing this, right, um, in those cases. So, so the, in, in other words... Uh, in the majority of what's happening in the worship scene today um, with the charismatic influence, um, I see that as a big factor. Um, now, there's there's a lot of debate on what exactly the texts mean when they say raise holy hands. Is it, is it, is it a metonymy? In other words, part for a whole, describing you know, lifting a holy life. Um, could be, you know, I, I think it's something we need to wrestle through. But the, the biggest question for me would be why? Is it just an emotional experience? Um, or, or is it something else? Uh, but again, I, you know, I don't, I don't think I, I, I wouldn't kick someone out of a service for raising their hands. But again, in my service, I don't think people would because the music is not doing that. Um, so if, you know, if the reason people are raising their hands is because the music is visceral and it's creating an emotional experience, then we've got, then the hands is not the issue. Um, with the dancing, you know, I, uh, I've got a couple sources I can give you, but I'm convinced uh, that the dancing for the Hebrews was part of their, it was a folk dancing that was part of their um, their folk life. It was not part of their corporate worship. Men with men, women with women, clearly. Um, and so if there is some sort of cultural equivalent outside of worship today, I think there's nothing wrong with that sort of folk, you know, um, celebratory act, but I don't see it anywhere connected directly with worship. Would would be a, the answer to your daughter. <laughs> so I, you know, I can dance around with my kids, but I don't do it, don't do it in corporate worship. You know, but though you know, I and these are these are not easy easy questions. They, they are things that sometimes we've given pat answers to that I don't want to. Um, and you're right. I mean, some of it, some of our knee jerk reaction is because of the excesses, for example, the charismatic movement. So. I think we do need to wrestle through you know, some of that. I think part of this goes back to the principles he was talking about this afternoon in terms of natural associations. And I was trying to think, what was the other category you Conventional. Had? Conventional. With, the, with what's happened with the charismatic movement, there are things that, that might have been done, you know, raising somebody raising their hand or just as a sort of a natural response because of their subjective state at the time because of who knows what's going on. Um, takes on a whole new connotation in, in today's world. And so if you're in a congregation that is not charismatic and, you know, for, you know, just whatever reason, you just sort of feel that as a natural response, it's viewed in an, it, it, it's, it's viewed as something totally different by everybody around you. And that's just p- part of It's not that it's right or wrong. It's just understanding contextualization today is different from prior to 1900. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are times, too, that, that and it hits all of us at different times in different ways. Um, Mark and I, I'm going to make share what you shared with me earlier. We all go through different times, different events in life, and sometimes we can sing a hymn, especially, we're, and as pastors, we're not any different from anybody in the pew. And I see people in my congregation who, because of any number of factors in their personal life, Sing a hymn. It was a hymn that was sung at their husband's funeral or at their mother's funeral or at some other. And nine times out of ten when they sing it, everything's fine, but that day it hits them and tears go down their eyes. Well, if you're Mark Perkins or Robbie Dean and you think of Gordon Shearer in the last week just before you get up, you've got to stop and sort of regain some control. You may have tears going down your eyes. It's not because you're manufacturing. Something that you just sang or whatever just hits you as it would anybody else, and you have that little bit of an emotional response. There's nothing wrong with that. What happens today is because of these other issues around that's not understood, it's under, taken wrong, whatever. But there's nothing wrong with... Uh, a proper emotional response. You seeing, you hear the story of the Spaffords and the loss of their four daughters before we sing, It Is Well With My Soul. Sometimes there's not a dry eye in the house. That's nothing wrong with that. But 
it's not something we want to try to manufacture and make that happen every time. How we achieve that balance in life is just part of how we handle emotion in life. And sometimes we go so far that we don't want to ever indicate that we might be getting excited about God. Lord knows. We wouldn't want anybody to think we were getting passionate about the Word of God or our relationship with God. And so we tend to go in the other, the other direction. So I think we, you know, we, we need to have a little more maturity in how we, we think about some of these things. Yeah. Can I just say something real quick just related to that? Uh, this, this is why I think Jonathan Edwards' perspective is so helpful because, you know, when we think of the Great Awakening, we think about people clinging to the pillars, fearful for their lives and passing out. And that kind of thing did happen. And Edwards actually defended it. Um, he actually defended it that sometimes when the Holy Spirit moves, sometimes there are violent outbursts of emotion. That does happen. So he defended it, but... He was careful to say, this doesn't have to happen to everybody. Um, and so they would, when that would happen, they would actually remove the person so that other people wouldn't think, oh, I need to do that too. Um, and then, like I said, eventually what happened is people defined spiritual experience by that and so then looked, okay, what can we use to create that? If the Holy Spirit moves and I have an emotional experience, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but the problem is when I define the experience by that and seek to manufacture it. That's, that's the danger. Go ahead. Scott, appreciate your balanced approach and objectivity on all this. What do you see as a second and third order effects, the consequence of the consequence as a church or movement becomes more lights and smoke, as you're saying? Obviously, we can see it in the charismatic denomination, but... What other areas of our spirituality are affected, even our faith, does idolatry enter, enter into it? Yeah, because what, happen, what happens is um, we, when, it, when it comes to visceral effects, um, we constantly need more to create the same effect. So, you know, we, we can apply this to, to alcohol, to drugs, whatever it is. In order to get a buzz, eventually we need a little more of it. And then we need a little more of it, and it's addictive. Well, the same is true for, for the kinds of, of, of effects that are created with music, for example, which is, which is exactly why the industry created pop music. It's because it is inherently addictive. You need more, and you need newer, and you need more exciting to continue to create the same buzz. So the effects then long term is eventually, I mean, I don't, we hit, you know, eventually we hit a brick wall spiritually if we've been dependent upon these stimulants to create what we think is a spiritual experience, eventually we're going to run out of steam. We're going to run out of the stimulant. Um, and this is why I think, you know, we, we see so many kids growing up in churches like that and they just leave the faith. One of the reasons is that they've, they've grown up being dependent upon some sort of visceral stimulants to create what they were told was worship, and eventually they just have burnout. Um, and, and so, yeah, idol- it, 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 we, we end up worshiping worship, right? We, we end up worshiping the physical experience, and it is exactly idolatry. Okay, one, one more question, and then I don't know where Alan went. Well, you just now raised your hand, and I was. This gentleman was long ahead of you, Catherine. Well, you're you're not. T- well, then, then, then. It's not so much of a question. Um, I thought whether I should say something or not, but I, I just wanted to give a little balance uh, to what we were just talking about because. Um, I'm 68 years old, not 38 years old, but many times in our church, um, and it's a very small little church, when I feel uh, especially moved by the lyrics of the song or how they hit me or how what's however I feel that day when I'm hearing that song, to raise my hands and and normally with my eyes closed even... Um, seems to be the perfect extension of my worship. And, um, and I will say that um, I, I agree with you for motivation. I think God looks at the motives of our heart and not so much just what are we doing. Mm-hmm. 
And, uh, and so my, my question would be to somebody who says, well, should I do this, is, is would you do it if you were standing in the back of the church? Or do you only mm-hmm. do it when you're up in front where everybody sees you? Yeah, that's a good question. That's, you know, one. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I certainly, uh, I'm also a missionary to Costa Rica, so I, I, I see a lot of the jumping up and down and the, you know, the whole entertainment scene. And, uh, and it is very much working people into a frenzy. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I've seen both ends yeah. of it, but I think there is a balance in that. Sure. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Well, if I could let John Hintz talk. Point made. Point made. But, madam, yes. you must enunciate. I will always enunciate, and I will say that I knew Robbie when he was in diapers. Oh. I. <clears throat> I never changed them, but I saw him in them. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, that's quite all right. It's wonderful. And so that's how long I've known him. That's why I was doubtful that he would even let me speak. Uh, my question is that you talk about drawing near to God, which I really believe in. <clears throat> and after we have drawn near to God through unmeritorious faith in Christ alone... It has always been my understanding the only way we as believers can draw near to God is through 1 John 1, 9 by confessing our sins so that we will be guaranteed that we have the filling of the Holy Spirit because there can be no worship in the church age without the filling and the control and the influence of the Holy Spirit. Is that not true? Yeah, I think, you know, a great benefit of confession is that we're, not that we're, um, you know, having to continually confess our sins and be resaved, but that we're acknowledging before God we need Christ in order for this, this relationship to take place. And absolutely, the, you know, the Holy Spirit. I, 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 I wasn't speaking of being resaved. Yeah, no, right. You and 